welcome back to the podcast, Corman. Thanks for having me on. We sort of talked about this topic a little bit before, but I've now read your book and it's really excellent. Um, and so I have a bunch more questions. And so you, you kindly agreed to come back on the podcast. Um, we know each other pretty well. One of the things I didn't know about was your grandfather, who you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, at some point later in the book. Um, and you use his story to illustrate how sort of well-intentioned advice from white people to black people about the extent of racism in society can potentially backfire. Um, what's that to do with your grandfather's story? Yeah, so I think there's a there's a lot of people that might agree with some points I make about the prevalence of racism, the decline of racism, but they might think, well, what's what's the harm in exaggerating racism a little bit, right? I, I can see the harm in under exaggerating racism but is there actually any shouldn't we err on the side of assuming that there's more racism and white supremacy out there so that we're really facing the problem and i wanted to highlight the fact that there there is a potential harm including to black people people of color in general to exaggerating racism and rather than make an argument i just use a, a story that my grandfather wrote uh when he wrote a short memoir of his life. He just turned 90 last year. And in his memoir, he writes of, uh, of a time in the 1950s where he was a, uh, one of the few black Americans in those days to have an engineering degree from Ohio State. He grew up in segregated DC. And he started working at General Electric in the 1950s. And at that time, there were basically two paths. You could be an engineer or you could be a manager. And the manager path had upward mobility. Um, but he was warned by a well-meaning white colleague that the white engineers at GE would not work for a black manager. And he took that seriously and believed it. And so he just stayed in his humble engineering uh spot for for many years uh, but then you know something changed and he decided uh, the managing spot opened up and he had been there for a long time and he decided to go for it and he asked his boss you know i'd like to put my name in for the management position and his boss was surprised and said i didn't i didn't know you had any interest in this uh, you never displayed any interest and he got the job, and lo and behold, it turned out his white colleagues had no problem working for a black manager. And the the parable is that he spent years not pursuing something greater than his station because he was worried, uh, he was made to worry by a well-intentioned colleague that there was more racism in his environment than there actually was. And he had ample reason, his priors as someone that grew up under Jim Crow would have led him, led him to believe that. So that was just one example of the fact that exaggerating racism, being misled about the extent of racism can actually prevent you from reaching higher, that there are costs to error in both directions. Yeah, I think that's an important point that we need to uh, be realistic and accurate in how we perceive the world. There's certainly a cost to underestimating how much racism and discrimination there is because that would stop us from being able to take the relevant remedies to ensure that we stop discriminating in those ways. But there can also absolutely be cost psychic uh, career opportunity and otherwise in, uh, in underestimating how much progress we've made. Um, uh, how did you come to think about these issues when you were um, you know, in school, starting to uh, understand your own racial identity and starting to understand, you know, the realities of, of, of the United States. What was your sort of trajectory in whether role, race played a big role in your life? What kind of attitudes people around you had towards it? And what kind of attitudes you yourself uh, developed over time? Yeah, so I grew up in a, a, a diverse and liberal town, had friends of every race, but didn't think of them as belonging to a race. We had Martin Luther King Day every year in school, and we would listen to his famous speech, and I got goosebumps and lived as close to Martin Luther King's dream as, as, as one can, I think. And 
Then when I was around 16, I went to a uh, something called the People of Color Conference, which was a kind of elite conference for private school kids that, uh, and it was there, that was the first time I encountered the, a totally different attitude towards race. Whereas growing up in, in Montclair, New Jersey, the attitude was that race is only skin deep, race doesn't matter, you judge people by the content of their character, period. At this People of Color conference, I got the idea that my race, my blackness, as it was called, was kind of a, a magical quality. It was, it was like a slice of God inside my soul. And that's how race was talked about at, at this conference. And later I would learn that all these ideas have names like intersectionality, critical race theory. But this is, you know, when I was 16 in 2012, I didn't know any of that. I just knew that this was a very new philosophy and a very strange one. Didn't expect to ever encounter it again until I went to Columbia University two or three years later, and it was now the dominant philosophy. And I tell the story in the book of orientation at Columbia when they did an exercise where they had the black kids go in one corner, the white kids in another, Asian kids, Hispanic kids, etc. And my feeling that whatever the intention of this policy, the effect was to make me feel more distance from my classmates and to be kind of hyper aware of them seeing me as a black person and as a victim as a result. So the genesis of my interest in race was not that I was interested in race. The genesis was that I was interested in the sharp difference between the philosophy of race I grew up with, which I consider to be the default civil rights liberal philosophy of, of race and the new philosophy of race I encountered at the POC conference in Columbia, which hyper-focused on the importance and, and essential uh, the, the kind of racial essence of blackness and whiteness and so forth. That difference bothered me a lot, and it, that was my uh, understanding that difference was my entry point into thinking and writing about race. Um, how do you think we should deal with the problems that arise even among broadly well-intentioned people. So sort of one step that you skipped over in telling your evolution is something you mentioned in the book where you move when I believe you're 12 or 13 or something along those lines from uh, a public school that is very diverse to a private school uh, that is somewhat less diverse and in which people treat you as you describe it sort of very positively and nicely. You have good friends and so on. Um, but, you know, a bunch of people do things like, you know, wanting to touch your hair because you have a huge afro at the time, right? Um, and he said, n not any one of these people was particularly obnoxious. Not any one of these people was particularly persistent. They didn't tease you or, or bully you for it. Um, but, but it did sort of take on this psychic harm, uh, uh, you know, or, or this, um, uh, you know, it, 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 was, it was a burden, right? It was annoying. Yeah. Um, you, you're pissed off of it, right? Very understandably. And, and I think it's sort of interesting to reflect on how our culture teaches us to deal with these things. How can we find remedies for those very real uh, problems, which you know some people call microaggressions, not a term I like, but I think it does describe a real phenomenon, uh, but without teaching us to lean into it too much. And I, I have to admit that I'm, I have a personal uh, motivation in asking the question. Because I grew up, uh, and I don't, I mean, there's many disanalogies there, but there's also some mm. important analogies, as a Jew in Germany, right, as the representative of a very salient victim group in the German context. Um, and I uh, experienced various forms of, whether they're microaggressions or micro uh, cuddlings, you know, micro, I want to prove to you how much I love you and how sorry I am for the past and the sort of philosemitic element of this. And for a while, it did really shape my attitude towards Germany, towards the country I grew up in, in quite a significant way, because it always felt like it was creating this kind of distance towards people. And I think I kind of fell into a trap um, of over-indexing on that for a little while. And it was only once I was able to get away from Germany and get some distance from it, but it was that I'm now able to go and re-engage with Germany and sort of uh, something like this happened to me recently. Some drunk guy at a holiday party was going on about, you know, all the Jews that his family saved because he knew I was Jewish in a kind of creepy way, you know. Um, uh, and I kind of could, could laugh it off and shake it off. But, 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 but what's the right attitude we should teach people 
towards those kind of experiences where we, we, we take this seriously as something that can be bothersome to people. We don't completely trivialize it, but we also mm. don't sort of encourage people to lean into an identity of victimhood on the basis of those kinds of things when they're not ill-intentioned and they, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have to make it impossible for you to stand in, in real friendship and real connection to, to others around you. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So just to put more color on it, the experience you're talking about in my case was I, I had a big Afro went from, as you said, a school where having an Afro was normal. So it's not just that it was a black school, so maybe 30% black, but all, all the white kids there saw kids with Afros all the time. It wasn't notable. And I went to a school where now it was notable because the white kids there and, and the Asian kids just didn't know anyone with an Afro. So they would just touch it all the time. And the intent, the intention was totally benign, but the effect was, it was just so fucking annoying and it built up and built up. And I didn't want to, uh, I, I felt like I would have to be in the position of a, a dick to, to tell them to stop. So it just, it became this, this problem for me. And, um, you know, the, the, the POC conference, the, the woke philosophy you know, taught me to view this as a microaggression and actually on the continuum of racism with, you know, all, all with slavery and lynching on one end and this kind of thing on the other. Um, but, you know, I, I think framing it that way is very powerful and it imputes an ill motive on the people doing it, which just in fact wasn't there. And it's, you know, I, I think you ask like, what is the right approach to take to these kind of situations? Well, the wrong approach is to assume and impugn the motives of people doing things that actually have benign motives. And one way of, of, of looking at it is, you know, I just landed on this uh, a few days ago. I've been to Japan several times. And one, one of the times I went to Japan, I also had a huge Afro. And Japanese people, they were very interested in that too. And it, it, you know, their, their benignness was so clear in them wanting to touch my Afro. And I think because you're in a foreign country, you would never assume that they're touching your Afro to be racist. I mean, these were the same people I was staying at their homes and they were making full, you know, spread breakfasts for me <laughs> every day. Right. They were polite to a, to a huge degree. And it was really just genuine curiosity. But when you put that same curiosity in the hands of a white American 12 year old, you're supposed to think of it as microaggression and, and so on and so forth. So I think the wrong approach is to ignore intentions because intentions matter. Uh, on the other hand, how I dealt with it by simply just ignoring it until it built up and I got, you know, uh, upset enough to cry to my parents about it. Well, that's not really that's not really good either, right? I think a wise adult in that situation or, or a wiser child would have said, I've got to set boundaries with these kids. I've got to tell them, I know you want to touch my hair, but it's not cool to do that. Uh, it makes me feel like shit. It ruins, you know, the, the preparation I've done. And I know you don't mean anything by it, but y y I'm asking you to stop, right? And if they persisted after that point, well, then, they, then you get into a situation where maybe it's bullying. But so there, there's, I, I guess the way to walk the line is to respect the concept of intention. That makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that, that I suppose puts a lot of uh, charge on the person who has to correct the behavior, right? So it, it, it assumes that this 13 year old, which may very well have been true in your case, but it's probably not true of most 13 year olds in the world, is able to express and communicate very calmly and rationally to say, hey, I don't think you're a dick. I don't think you're a bad person. I know that you're well intentioned, but you know what? This is kind of annoying to me and a problem. And could you please stop? Right. Um, so so I guess one objection that people might have to that solution is um you know, it puts the onus on solving the situation to the person who, in whatever limited way, is the victim of the situation. And some right. people may have 
the uh, cool headedness and the intelligence and the maturity to put up with that, but 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 others likely won't. Right, but my response to that would be that the, this the point goes both ways. So yes, it puts onus on the twelve or thirteen year old to be to have a level of maturity that most can be expected to have. But uh, what, what's the alternative? The, the alternative is placing the onus on e all of the other 12 and 13 year olds to realize that their benign curiosity, which they know is benign, uh, that they should rather than touch my Afro out of benign curiosity, they should have the maturity, which most of them are not going to have as 12 and 13 year olds to say, what my what effect might my benign curiosity about his hairstyle that I've never been close to before, uh, how might that affect him in the aggregate when we're all doing it all day? It would expect a level of empathy from them and a level of almost mind reading that adults develop, but that most 12 year olds also don't have. So I think the the wiser way the, the wiser thing to do is, you know, if something is bothering you, you have to take initiative. That's the, that's the fact of life at the end of the day. You have to take initiative and, and come up with boundaries and wise solutions to your own problems. And th th that was a learning experience for me. You can't just expect the world, I think, to conform to and, and understand that you're upset with something. So uh, I, I think the point goes both ways. I mean, the other thing I, I guess to say about this is that this is why it's so important not to place incidents like this on a false continuum, right? You, you, you talk about how, mm. uh, you know, you were taught at this conference to think of this kind of act as, you know, a much more mild version of something like racial segregation or slavery or the most extreme forms of racial discrimination. And that, of course, means that you are pushed towards a zero tolerance attitude, right? You can't have any of those kind of incidents um, uh, you know, in, in a decent community because it's on a continuum with slavery and so on, right? I think if you have a more reasonable read of this, which is that um, the intentions matter, in this case, the intentions of neither of the parties is in any way uh, negative. There is a problem and an injustice, right? It's unfair that as a 12 or 13-year-old, you have to deal with that shit. Um, but it's not the end of the world. It, 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 it's not going to destroy your life. It's not going to traumatize you forever. Um, and, you know, then we can uh, lean into the attitude that, of course, in a deeply diverse society, sometimes people are going to annoy each other. Sometimes pe people are going to act in uh, inconsiderate ways. Um, and we should certainly be careful about that. We should certainly be attentive to that. But we don't have to over-dramatize it when it happens. Right. Um, you um, have a really interesting account of the nature of race. I have to say that I have struggled with how to formulate this myself. And in my penultimate book, The Great Experiment, I come up with, I think, broadly a similar framework, but not as clearly and explicitly as you do in your book. And the puzzle to me is that um, clearly, if we are skeptical about uh, the role that race should play in a decent society, we should be very skeptical about claims that naturalize race claims that make it uh, uh, appear like a uh, un straightforward biological reality. This is something that straight up racists do. You argue, and we'll get to this point, that some forms of neo-racists on the left also naturalize race in that kind of way. And we know that there's all kinds of arbitrary distinctions we make about race, that somebody who's half white and half black counts as black in the United States, but not necessarily in an African country, that the concept of Latino is a really complicated one that was deeply influenced by various social influences. Now, that means that the, the, the temptation is to say it's just a social construct, it's just something humans have invented, but you don't quite buy that either. You sort of give a, a third account of the nature of race. Can you explain to us why we shouldn't go all the way to social construction um, and, 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 and how we should, in fact, think about the nature of, of race? Yeah, that's exactly right. I So... The way this debate is typically framed is that race is either a natural concept or a social construct. Uh, I argue that it's something in between. I argue that it's a social construct inspired by a biological reality. And I think it's best explained by analogy. In the book, I give, I give the example uh, of 
time constructs. So on the one hand, you have the concept of a day. A day is not a social construct. The sun really rises and sets, and a day almost perfectly matches uh, the, the rising and setting of the sun. So if we all forgot what a day was and our minds were wiped, we would invent the concept of a day exactly the same way from scratch because it matches reality. So that's, that's a good example of a, of, a, of, a, of a natural kind, if you will. And, uh, on the other hand, a social construct is something like a seven-day week. There have been societies with eight-day weeks and 10-day weeks, and we, we could have a six-day week if we wanted to. It's, it's really arbitrary. Nothing in the universe rotates or revolves every seven days. It's just, uh, and if we got rid of that concept, we might not reinvent it the same way. So that's really a social construct. But then you have a third kind of concept, like a month. A month is, is a social construct in the sense that nothing begins when February does and ends when March does. Uh, we distribute the number of days kind of, you know, somewhat randomly throughout these months. And, you know, it, it doesn't track anything closely. But it's not like a week because a month was, the month was inspired by the concept of the lunar cycle. And it's not an accident that month and moon come from the same Latin root and that months are fairly close generically to the length of the lunar cycle, which is 29 point something days. So a month is a social construct that's inspired by a natural reality. I think that's what race is. The, the reason race is not a pure social construct, or let me put it this way. Then you ask, what is the natural reality that race is inspired by? Well, it's the fact that our best understanding of population genetics and the history of Homo sapiens suggests that there were major migrations out of Africa of populations that remained separated for tens, tens of thousands of years, separated by oceans, separated by mountains, and as a result evolved in divergent ways th that and the legacy of the, that divergent evolution is still visible today it's why we have skin color differences why we have facial shape differences and once you could see uh, sequence the genome you c you could ask the question that you can ask of any data set which is is this variation randomly dispersed and equidistant or are there clusters of, of variation? And then you can, you can ask how strong the clustering is. So in the case of something like gender, you have extremely strong near-perfect clustering, which is to say almost everyone with a Y chromosome also has testes. Almost everyone with two X chromosomes has, has, an ovary, has ovaries. And you just get two non-overlapping sets with, with almost no crossover. Race is not like that. When you, when you um, l sequence people's genomes and look at variation, you do get clustering, which is why I, you can't say that there's no there there in studying population genetics. But, but you get clusters with lots of overlap, uh, lots of bleeding into each other, messy borders. And so the clustering is real, but it's not sharp. And I think I tried my best to convey that uh, in, in the book. I found that to be very persuasive and it creates, it, it solves the problems that either of the pure accounts have, right? So obviously the problem with uh, the sort of naive biological account of race is not only that it's often been misused in terrible ways in history, but that it simply has trouble dealing with those bleeding borders between different kind of ethnic groups, that it naturalizes a set of ethnic categories we use in various contexts, even though the kinds of ethnic categories we use in the United States have changed over time. And our neighboring countries use very, very different categories to try and track some of the same underlying differences. And so it makes something appear natural that clearly is not entirely natural. On the other end, I think there's a problem with a pure social construction account, because, you know, uh, if you send off your DNA to 23andMe, 23andMe is actually going to be very accurate 
in predicting where your ancestors come from without knowing anything about you. You can lie. You can put on a Chinese name on the order form to make it, uh, you know, think that you're East Asian. It's not going to think you're East Asian if you're not, right? Um, so clearly there's some kind of biological reality that uh, is at stake here. And so I think that, that hybrid account of saying there are obviously some biological variations that explain differences of skin color and other kinds of physical traits that explain why we're pretty good at guessing which kind of ethnic group somebody probably belongs to in most cases, but not in all cases, right? Um, and at the same time, um, uh, you know, we don't want to go overweight towards biological essentialism. But that was very convincing to me. Mm. What does that mean for how we should think about race in society, right? If it was a purely natural account, then you might be tempted to say, well, perhaps racial categories are natural and we should organize our society around them to some extent. Perhaps not fully, but to some extent, right? If you think it's a complete social construction, it's completely invented, there's, there's, there's nothing it tracks, then perhaps uh, the best hope is to abolish those categories altogether, to say we should never think in terms of race. Um, what kind of conclusion do you think follows from your hybrid account for what role race would play in a decent society? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I, I'm not actually sure what does follow because, you know, for instance, if it were the case that different races and ethnic groups were really sharply distinguishable genetically, I'm not sure what would follow from that. Yeah, I'm not sure it would follow that you know, that, that it wouldn't follow actually that, that politically we should treat differently on the basis, uh, people di treat people differently on the basis of race. All, right. all that and, would and example, follow. I mean, men and women, as you were saying, uh, uh, you know, in the biological sense, distinct. Um, and there are certain very specific contexts in which we decide to treat men and women differently in society. But we treat, but those contexts have shrunk over time for very good right. reasons. We think today that, you know, you being male biologically or you being female biologically should change how we treat you far less in far fewer circumstances than we would have thought a hundred years ago, right? So, so, so it's right. true, I think, and important to point out that there's no determ that you don't have to be a determinist, even if you believe it was biological. It doesn't mean that it necessarily licenses all kinds of forms of disparate treatment. Right. So, and you know, all, all that would follow really is that scientists would be correct to really categorize people um, by these by these racial groups, right? That That's what would follow if the racial realists were right, which they're not. Um, you know, everything else we care about would still be open to debate, what kind of politics we should have, and, and so on and so forth. I think the important thing to realize is that everything I've just talked about is under the heading of population genetics and the way those researchers think about population and race. When we're talking about race as normal everyday people, we're not talking about that subheading in the dictionary definition of race. We're really talking about something else. We're talking about categories that are constructed, that have evolved in a political context somewhat arbitrarily over the past 50 years. And whatever population geneticists discover about race, if they discover a huge new trove of ancient DNA that actually uh, proves that, I'm just making this up, it proves that, you know, uh, Chinese people are much more similar to Russians than they are to Japanese people, right? That wouldn't lead to us changing our Asian and Caucasian categories on, on the census, right? So, so those political categories have totally flown the perch of the science and whatever the science discovers tomorrow is not going to influence the everyday categories we're checking on the census. So we have to realize those boxes really at this point have flown the perch of the biological reality that inspired them. And in that sense, they are deep and real social constructs. Um, so let's take a, uh, let's go back to the analogy that you use, right? You say a, a month is somewhat equivalent to race in the sense of it both being a social construct and tracking some kind of biological reality. A week is much more arbitrary, right? There's no real biological reality it, it tracks. Um, but we use weeks and months 
in our discourse and they're useful, right? They're useful social constructs. They allow us to do things that help our society function. And, you know, would society function better if we had six days a week or eight days a week? Who knows? Perhaps, perhaps something would be better in the world. Perhaps. But, but the important thing is to have a concept, whether we, we use the seven day one or the six day one or the eight day one, um, it's arbitrary, but having some concept of a week has proven to be very useful. But um, what about race, right? Um, so it is some hybrid between these two. It's closer to the month than, than, than the week. Um, is it a useful social construct or is it a harmful social construct? And if, as I believe, you think that in broad terms we should be much more wary of racial talk, that we should talk about race in fewer contexts and certainly use it as a criterion for how to treat people in way fewer contexts, why is it that race is a harmful rather than a useful social construct? And if I can add one more question, how far should we get, go in moving away from it? Right? There are some race abolitionists who think this concept has done so much harm throughout history that we should just get rid of the category altogether. In a truly just society, we just wouldn't have any kind of racial categories for any kind of purpose. It might take us a while to get there, right? We might have to be aware of racial discrimination in order to build that society. But in the best kind of society, there just wouldn't be a concept of race. Are, are you a race abolitionist in that sense? Or do you step short of that degree of skepticism about uh, uh, sort of the usefulness or the harmfulness of uh, racial talk? Yeah, so addressing the first question first, is race a useful social construct? I argue in the book that it isn't for the following reason. When we're talking about public policy aimed at helping the poor, the disadvantaged, the unlucky, those that are, you know, some of us are born on third base thinking we hit a triple. Others are born with every possible disadvantage. And public policy has some role in helping, helping narrow the gap between those two kinds of people, right? People talk about privilege as a general concept. You know, uh, Elon Musk's kids have privilege that my mom, who grew up in the South Bronx in the 1960s, did not, right? We want to use public policy to pick out those sets of people, distinguish them, and determine who the government has an interest in helping and, and who the state who doesn't really need the help? Okay, so then the question becomes, is race the most useful proxy for that? And my argument in the book is, is that it's not. You know, if it were, that's what would change my opinion about this. If you could show me that, that the best proxy for picking out the disadvantaged as a class was race, then I would say, well, we ought to use race in public policy, right? It's the best proxy we have for disadvantage, for 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 poverty, for, for and so forth. But it's not the best proxy we have. The, the I mean, just just the proxy of any socioeconomic measure, really, you can think of, is automatically a, a better proxy. Whether we're talking about income or wealth or some more sophisticated combination measure that takes into account the level of crime where you grew up. That already is a better proxy for what we mean when we distinguish between someone that has had advantages in life and someone someone that doesn't. And so my argument is, is simply that the fact that socioeconomics is a much better proxy for what we mean when we talk about disadvantage means that r race is not a useful proxy. I mean, what what else would it be a useful proxy for? You could argue, okay, in America, is race a good proxy for, you know, having been a slave in this country, right? It certainly would have, uh, I mean, it would have been a pretty good proxy right after the Civil War, because the vast majority of black people in the South were not free blacks, but would have been just slaves. So you would have said, we want to pay back everyone who was a slave. Blackness is a pretty damn good proxy for having just been a slave, right? That would have been a good argument at the time. 
Um, you know, the, the more immigration has opened up, I think, you know, this is an outdated statistic and probably more at this point, but something like one third of black people in New York are immigrants, uh, probably, probably more now, actually. Um, so, you know, race is not a good proxy, certainly not the best proxy for anything we care about. And that is what makes me think that we should just get it out of public policy altogether. Now, but, but that's you, a, go ahead. So, so when you're talking about public policy, that's a specific application, right? So we should get into talking about uh, the idea of being race blind at, at some point. I don't want to steal your thunder, but your basic point, which which I think is 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 pretty persuasive, is you know, of course we should not be race blind in the sense of pretending we don't see race, um, in the sense of not being able to study when there are certain forms of racial discrimination. But we should be race blind in the sense of uh, not making how we treat each other or how the state treats all of us turn on a membership in some kind of racial demographic or category, right? So you've made the case right now, and I want to circle back to it, for that latter claim, right? We should not have policy that uses as its key metric what is your ethnic status within, you know, the United States census categories or something like that, right? But that's rather different from the sort of slightly broader question I asked about, right? Which is to say, well, here, here are two kind of ways in which we might think we don't want to abolish race, right? The first is, well, we want to be able to study racial discrimination, as you yourself argue, right? And so, um, you know, if, for example, researchers send out CVs, um, you know, to be called for first round interviews, um, and they alter the names on the CV or certain kinds of other lines, like what kind of high school club somebody was president of, in ways that signal or suggest race. And then we see that the person who is black is called for fewer first-run interviews than the person who is white. This is a very established research program. Interestingly, it's less the case today than it was a number of decades ago, I believe, but it still is the case to some extent, but, but black people then are called less, right? That's a useful use of race, right? Um, in so far as we're trying to understand our society today, that I think you would agree with me is is a perfectly sensible thing to study. And to study that, you know, in the paper we are writing that up, you need to use racial talk like African Americans and white people or something like that, right? Um, now, you might think that could be abolished in the ideal society, right? In the ideal society, we no longer have racial discrimination. Um, uh, you know, we actually treat each other fairly independently of the kind of skin color we have. And so perhaps we have no need for those kind of research studies. But even then you might say, well, look, you know, it's a fact about the United States that these people from quite disparate cultures in various parts of sub-Saharan Africa were brought to these shores forcibly against their will. But over time they have come to, uh, uh, you know, form a, an ethnocultural group that has a strong... Uh, a sense of identity and belonging. Um, and so that is something that, uh, you know, as long as its members want it to persist, and many of its members do want to persist, uh, we have reason to to value and to respect. Um, and I guess we can sort of try and change the modality in which we talk about it to say it's not really race, it's something else. And perhaps that's in fact right. But in that sense, at least, America will probably always have racism, will always have black culture, um, that, that always will hopefully intermingle in, kind of way, in all kinds of ways, and hopefully there'll be all kinds of interconnections, but it will probably have a persistence as its own kind of thing. And, and, and I guess I'd, I'd like to know your stance towards that as well. So yeah. if everything goes as well as it can, 2200, what kind of role would race play in social scientific studies, in our perception of American culture, sort of how far on the spectrum towards race abolitionism would you go? Yeah, so I, I definitely don't go as far as some people I know would go in response to these two questions. So for instance, I have no problem, uh, I have no problem with people studying, you know, racial discrimination until the end of time, right? I, I I, I have no problem with people doing callback studies, even if we got to a point in society where there just was no racism, I would still have no problem with people sending out CVs with African American sounding names, Chinese sounding names, white sounding names, and so forth to measure the, the, the no racism, which was in that ideal society. And I think they should be allowed to do so. And this is, I, I don't go as far as the, the French system and other systems, 
in the world which actually disallow people from even asking those questions or publishing those or collecting those 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 data well um, or at least state institutions can't do so it's perfectly fine right. for a private researcher in in france to do that and there's now actually a lot of sociologists and so on in france who do, do that oh yeah okay so so i think i think that's fine uh, really my you know the reason i talk about public policy is because my concern is specifically around treating people differently as a result of how they racially identify or are racially identified. Um, let me push you on the public policy piece of this. I think the other pieces of this were broadly uh, uh, aligned on or will, will be less controversial. Um, what do you respond to the argument that uh, you know, in an ideal country, uh, no public policy would turn on uh, racial characteristics or ethnic uh, designations. Um, but that, uh, you know, the extent of injustice that has been visited in particular on African Americans in the past is so extensive that, you know, we need certain forms of special treatment that would be temporary um, in order to remedy those injustices and ensure that uh, people can actually live up to to their talents and have the same kind of opportunities that people who may benefit from better schools, uh, uh, you know, intergenerational wealth and so on uh, would would benefit. Is there sort of any circumstance in which you think that uh, we can deviate from, uh, you know, treating people purely on the basis of categories of need like the demographic group? Um, or uh, uh, do you think that uh, that is never permissible? And if so, why? Yeah, so so given the reality of, you know, cultural differences being real, uh, I have no quarrel with the person that says, you know, I'm I'm Chinese and I prefer to live my life in a Chinese neighborhood eating Chinese food surrounded by Chinese culture. I'm black. I prefer to live my life in a black neighborhood surrounded by the culture I'm familiar with. I don't have any problem with that. I draw a really strict firewall between that as an attitude, which can be benign, and saying to the state, my people ought to be treated better. You ought to discriminate in favor of my racial group. I, I, I think you can say, you can have all of that cultural affinity without crossing over into racial discrimination, right? Uh, so, so that's essentially the position uh, I hold. Okay, great. Um, and then do you want to answer, we can jump, so there'll be a little bit of editing required here, which is fine. Uh -huh. Do you want to jump to answering the question about... Yes, sort of, yes, uh, sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So my view is, is, is very close to what Martin Luther King expressed in his book, Why We Can't Wait. In that book, he says, yes, we have to address the legacy of slavery. Yes, we have to address racial inequality. In other words, we have an interest in reducing it. But the way that we do that, he recommended, was by doing something he called the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, which, long story short, was a broad-based anti-poverty, class-based program that would have been targeted towards the white poor and black poor alike and would have disproportionately been targeted towards black people only as a result of black people being disproportionately poor, but would not have been targeted on the basis of race as such. So, you know, it, I don't think I'm ever going to, you know, we're never going to agree, I don't mean you and I, but as a, as a country, we may never agree on to what extent current black poverty and disadvantage and incarceration is directly traceable to slavery as opposed to other factors. Let's just table that debate and, and say whatever, whatever you think there, the way we should address it um, is by focusing on the people that are currently disadvantaged, right? The fact that I'm a descendant of slaves, it, it, it no longer matters. Uh, e even if there was some it no longer matters except for symbolically and maybe psychologically, but as someone who grew up upper middle class, grew up in the 
whatever top, whether it was the 1% or some close enough to it, you know, I'm not the problem we're talking about when we're talking about the legacy of slavery. Uh, the black kid that grew up across the street from me, the black family across the street from me is not the problem uh, that we're, we're talking about. The black kids I went to Columbia with are not the problem when we're talking about the legacy of slavery, racial inequality, et cetera. So the policies we use to tackle, tackle it ought to track the problem. And the way to track the problem is to look at class rather than to look at race. So it's not that, uh, it's not that I think all these issues should be out of mind and there's nothing to care about. It's that the way we, the way we should care about it responsibly in a way that provokes less backlash in a way that doesn't involve racially discriminating against whites and Asians and so forth is to base our policy on socioeconomics. Um, so I'm trying to think whether we disagree on this and uh, if so, whether I should change my mind. So mm -hmm. in The Identity Trap, I argue that in general, we should be skeptical about uh, reasoning through moral questions by looking at uh, sort of Supreme Court rulings, right? Or by looking at the language of the Constitution. I find, for example, that American debates about the death penalty are often unhelpful because they all are sort of, um, you know, distorted by this attempt to have to argue that it does or doesn't constitute cruel and unusual punishment. And I think that's just kind of like a weird way of thinking through the deeper moral issues that are at stake. You can sort of translate some of them into language about whether it's cruel and unusual, but that's just sort of an extra step that actually muddies the waters. Um, I find that uh, the debate about affirmative action is a little bit of an exception because I find the jurisprudence that has emerged on that topic relatively helpful. And in particular, the sort of framework that is actually shared among Antonin Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who disagreed about the legal permissibility of affirmative action, but, but agreed about the basic framework through which to analyze it. Um, and so that, roughly speaking, says, you know, as per the 14th Amendment, Uh, we should be very, very skeptical about any use of race in public policy because it has led us so terribly astray so many times. Um, that there can be exceptions when there's a compelling state interest. Um, but to serve that compelling state interest, we have to do it in a very narrowly tailored way. Um, and uh, we have to have st strict scrutiny about whether there's not alternatives available. So if you can... Uh, serve this compelling state interest without using race. We absolutely should do that. When you use race, it really, that use of race should be directly targeted towards realizing the compelling state interest rather than something else. So I guess my question to you is, would you reject that jurisprudential framework, which is broadly agreed from, again, Rupert Ginsburg to Antonin Scalia, um, and then we can have arguments about what falls under it or doesn't, Or do you think that framework is right? It's just, it's a zero, uh, it, it, you know, the, 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 the set is just, has zero members, right? Like, right. that's a fine way to thinking about it. It's just when we apply that to the United States today, or perhaps to any society, it's just no policy that uses race is ever going to pass that test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so <laughs> I, I think my, my, my opinion on that might be that if we look at the to, to leave that door even slightly ajar um, as as the the strict scrutiny standard does it seems it, what that has led to in effect is you know a massive proliferation of race-based policies uh, with each Supreme Court justice each politician, you know, d defining a compelling interest in totally incompatible ways that seem crazy uh, to, 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 to one another and are mutually incompatible. And, you know, isn't the lesson of that, that the door should not be left even, even slightly ajar? And uh, I, I know we talked about the 14th Amendment last time. I have some, some, uh, I quote the the book, The Colorblind Constitution, quite a bit in in mine. You know, had that not had that door not been left ajar at all, who knows exactly how the counterfactual turns out? 
but uh, my my suspicion is that leaving it even slightly ajar has led to uh, a, a just constant temptation to to fit things through that 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 slight hole and we might have been better off just slamming the door shut instead and, and and having something much closer to the spirit of the first amendment where it's just like you know you're not making any laws curbing speech in this country and in, and even then we've managed to, to 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 violate it in in you know situations especially wars and and, and so forth world war 1 so maybe it's better to actually close the door and just let it be pushed open at a couple of a couple of emergency moments in american history rather than leaving it slightly ajar which in practice makes it permanently swung all the way open that's interesting. So in a way, you've segmented the answer to the question into two steps, right? Well, one step is, could there in theory be policies that you and I would both agree pass this test? Because there's such a compelling state interest. There really is no other way of serving it. Um, it really is so narrowly tailored that, you know, we would hold our nose and say, you know what, in this kind of particular circumstance, it might be justified. But then there's a second order question about, you know, if that's very, very rare. And there's a very real danger of us uh, uh, sort of slipping into the use of race in more and more circumstances than is the sort of benefit we get from allowing this very particular policy outweighed by the risk of sliding into uh, a social world in which race plays a larger and larger role in our politics with all the kind of disastrous downstream consequences but have, including the kind of encouragement of zero-sum politics and, um, you know, ethnic interest organizing and, and so on and so forth. Um, and and so on, on that second test, you say, that's really the reason why we should hold firm and, and reject these kind of policies in, in general. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, essentially. I, I think it's, you know, the term slippery slope is often overused. And it's, it's always, it's actually always an empirical question whether something is in fact a slippery soap, a slippery slope. But I think you can make a very strong argument from the past 150 years of American history that leaving any room in the 14th Amendment for uses of race has, in fact, been a slippery slope. It's a common fallacy that the idea of a slippery slope is a fallacy. Um, uh, <laughs> you talk a lot in the book about what you call neo-racism. Um, so in a way, everything we've been talking about is an argument against an attack on a new school of thought that you and I are both preoccupied with in various ways, most uh, personified perhaps by Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi. Why is it that you call them neo-racists? And what is the problem, uh, according to you, of neo-racism? Yes, yeah, so there's been a, a fairly successful attempt to redefine racism as prejudice plus power, combined with the proposition that people of color and black people, Hispanic people don't have power, therefore can't be racist. Uh, I mean, in, in many domains, this, w this is simply accepted as the definition of racism. It's not the definition of racism that was held by the civil rights movement, uh, by civil rights leaders like Bayard Rustin, Dr. King, A. Philip Randolph, who took it for granted that all groups of people, including black people, can be racist. All groups of people can be victims of racism in principle. But we're, in fact, facing a world where the problem of racism was a thousand to one in the direction of uh, black people suffering it. So that that uh, I adopt that philosophy as, as my own and that definition of racism uh, as my own. And so when I encounter, you know, public intellectuals and writers, uh, someone like D'Angelo, who, uh, you know, just frankly, you know, s stereotypes white people wantonly, says that white people are, you know, uh, he, he sa says that she strives to be less white. And when asked what she means, says, when I when I when I want to when I say be less white, I mean, be less ignorant, I mean, be less defensive, I mean, be less and then on and on. Just this list of uh, invidious stereotypes and generalizations i don't know what else to call that other than racism and i don't think we need a new word um so i i use the old word with neo attached to it just to uh 
uh, I mean, I, I could have just used racism, but but to to use neo racism is is simply to highlight an emergent strand of it, an emergent strand of it that is is as racist as as anything, at least uh, in principle, and to call a spade a spade. Um, you characterize neo racism in part by the use of a number of uh, key fallacies. Um, uh, they include the disparity fallacy, the myth of undoing the past, the myth of no progress, the myth of inherited trauma, the myth of superior knowledge, the racial ad hominem, and then the myth of black weakness. Um, take us through some of those. You don't have to mention every single one, but 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 why do you think uh, sort of these fallacies stand at the heart of neo racism, and what 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 is the nature of these fallacies? Why should we worry about them? Yeah, I think the um, the, the most inf- important one is is the the disparity fallacy. This is something that Thomas Sowell has probably dedicated literally 10 or more books to dismantling. But simply put, it's the idea that whenever you see a disparity, that is evidence of discrimination, systemic or or overt. Um, the problem with that belief is that when you, you know, the, the set of disparities it would predict are starkly different from the set of disparities that actually exist. So if it were true that disparities are in general caused by racism or of some kind, um, you would not expect it to be the case, you know, it, it wouldn't be the case that ethnic groups of the same race are distributed all along the continuum on on every outcome of import. And I quote many examples from comparing Indian Americans to Bengali Americans, uh, Chinese Americans to Hmong Americans, Nigerians to Haitians, and so forth, who face the same amount of discrimination and yet have wildly different outcomes. If discrimination were uh, the main the main variable in the equation of success, then it wouldn't be possible to vary that much in success while the the main variable stayed constant. So that that's just the generic idea um and that's it's an extremely energizing idea in reporting about racism and racial inequality and probably the most important one that for for people to sort of sort of get get over um the so uh, how should we think about uh these kind of racial disparities right because mm-hmm. um uh, I get the fact that there's natural variation in outcomes for all kinds of reasons. Um, there's cultural attributes that mean that some people end up being more interested in certain kinds of professions, and then in particular moments, these one set of professions might be more lucrative than others. You know, that might also lead to reverses in which kind of uh, group of an origin in some particular country is doing better at one uh, uh, sort of moment or the next, right? I mean, there's one story that claims to explain why Jews have been relatively successful, which is that they were excluded from farming communities at a time when uh, that actually put them into huge poverty for centuries. But as a result, when you had a sort of rapid expansion in kind of skilled middle-class jobs for, you, for which you needed to be literacy, that gave Jews certain kinds of advantages. I don't know whether or not that's a historically accurate story, but it's a commonly told story about how Jews and um, you know, Europe in the, in the 19th century came to be very successful uh, early on, right? Um, but but there's a kind of, uh, you know, risk here that, that you might say, look, first of all, we do want to be on the guard against racial discrimination. And so, uh, you know, seeing that some company doesn't employ any people of a particular group or very few people of a particular group just seems like a helpful kind of first order heuristic that there may be something going on here. Perhaps we want to look into that. Um, and then secondly, I think that there's a fear that people have that if you say, look, variation is just natural and some people are just going to have different outcomes from others, that could open the door to explanations that are rooted in a more straightforward form of biological racism, right? That some people are going to say, well, look, um, if you don't think that there should be roughly equal outcomes, it must be because you believe at some level that some ethnic groups are less intelligent or have less kind of aptitude for performing well in a uh, you know economy that prizes high cognitive skills. And so really that just opens the door for this kind of racist view of a world. So, so how do we sort of resist what you say is this disparity fallacy uh, without either 
um, becoming sort of overly naive about the world and saying any form of disparity is probably just this natural variation, random reasons, who cares, or uh, giving it a cast that basically says, well, look, the disparity is because of uh, you know, these biological differences between population groups and then you very quickly get into uh, these form of uh, uh, racializing or racist assumptions. Yeah, so uh, to the first question, I think uh, in my in my book, I say that disparities are like tumors. They, they seem very scary and indicative, but actually the mo majority of them are benign. There's a concept of benign disparity. Um, I, I, I think that you know, what we need is, is, is to be evidence-based here. So, and the evidence suggests that there is lots of racism against minorities. There is lots of racial discrimination against minorities. Okay. That I, you know, I cite the, what was at least at the time of writing the largest to date study of callback, uh, meta-analysis of callback studies, which found significant levels of racial discrimination against black Americans, Arab Americans, Indian Americans, Chinese Americans. That's all true uh, and evidence-based, but it seems to be less important, uh, far less important as a determinant of outcomes than, than many people would assume. Um, what we should try to do is wherever possible, eliminate racial discrimination make try to make society more and more like a blind audition obviously that's totally impractical in, in many um in many domains but wherever it is possible um you know blind yourself to the data that might bias you you know grade your students papers without knowing who you're grading um, audition people behind a veil um you know and and so that that's point one point two is we, we really ought to raise our children in as colorblind a way as possible, which is to say children by default tend not to be racist. They tend to have a lot of flaws like selfishness. They need to be taught to share. But most human beings don't come out the womb ascribing meaning to, to racial characteristics. And that, that ought to be nurtured and extended as, as long as possible so that people are generally uh, we we raise colorblindness as a as a cultural norm, um, and then if we if we are aggressive on that end on trying to actually fight racial discrimination, I, I would even support things like sting operations in housing markets. They you know they they've done this. Um, I forget which news outlet did this in uh, Staten Island, I believe, and I, I quote it in the book and found quite a bit of racial discrimination sending trained actors into uh, situations where real estate agents were treating people differently according to their race. I mean, th there's no reason you, there can't be like a health, health inspection equivalent of, of, uh, of doing that in all, all kinds of domains if it's done rigorously and, and seriously. But that's, that's the point at which we should intervene on racial discrimination. We should not, we can't assume that outcomes are indicative. I mean, that, that's just, I think that's just not supported. So that, that's to the first point. And to the second point, I think, I, I mean, I, I really think that studying, the more you study ethnic and cultural differences, it's not the case that you get more, you lean more towards uh, biological explanations of disparity. I think in some way you lean less towards them by studying how different ethnicities of the same race, often from the same exact part of the part of the world, can do wildly differently based on cultural differences, based on uh, historical happenstance. You know, w whether or not your historical uh, the 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 theory about uh, Jewish success is right, stories like that are are true of many different groups, right? It's like you're, you're, you're of one religion and you're locked out of some profession and then you develop a set of skills that happen to be really remunerative in a different setting um, and, and so on. So really cultural differences are enough to get you massive differences in outcomes uh, within the same race, within the same uh, groups of people that speak the same language, groups of people that look the same, are from the same part of the world. So I don't think the, the more you get into this, the less you are seduced by biological explanations of disparity.
that's a very interesting point that, you know, if that fear was right, um, then, you know, when you study at so, when you study socioeconomic outcomes in the United States, you might find that, you know, whites consistently do very well and Asians consistently do very well and then Hispanics consistently do badly and African-Americans or black people consistently do very badly. If a vaguely, you know, a broadly racist view of a world was right, or one particular racist view of a world, you would find something like that, right? But what you actually find is that, um, you know, the outcome for whites varies hugely. And, uh, for example, some French Canadians who came down to New England um, about a century ago do, do very, very poorly, whereas other white groups uh, do well. Um, you find that, um, you know, uh, in Britain, for example, uh, uh, South Asians of uh, Indian extraction do pretty well. South Asians of Bangladeshi uh, extraction do very badly. Um, and you find in the United States um, that a lot of black immigrants do extremely well, right? So Nigerian Americans, for example, have hugely uh, overproportionate uh, uh, average income uh, compared to, 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 to white Americans. Um, uh, so, so I think that there's a very interesting case in, in that. Um, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about Thomas Kuhn's uh, uh, famous book on the structure of scientific revolutions. And what he says is that when there's a research program, it's been a while since I read the book, so I might be butchering it a little bit, but when there's a research program that sort of claims to explain something, at the beginning it gains you know, followers because it does in fact explain important things and allows us to make certain discoveries and so on. But at some point you start to get these kind of anomalies, right? There's like certain things that this worldview, this paradigm can't explain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, over time, those anomalies keep adding up. Um, and you might think that at that point, people abandon this view, but they actually don't. Um, in part, because they don't have an alternative. They need to explain the world somehow. They need to have a field of study to be explaining these things. And so they kind of are starting to see these anomalies. Um, they don't play them a lot of the time, because there's no more helpful way of seeing the world. It is really when you have a rival paradigm, when a new researcher comes in and says, hey, we can look at this whole field in this different kind of way, and that actually helps to explain these anomalies, and that's more fruitful. But over time, as generations of scientists get substituted and so on, you have suddenly a, a scientific revolution. You have suddenly people starting to recognize the superiority of a new paradigm. Um, I think part of the attraction of a neo-racist view is that it, it is a story, right? It's a story that helps us to explain uh, why there's injustice and discrimination in our society and what to do about it. And a lot of people are very motivated by wanting to do something about those injustices for very good reason, because they look around America and see that it's in many ways an unjust society um, uh, and say, I want to do something about it. And the only people who are offering a real story right now uh, uh, at least on the question of race, are the neo-racists, as you would call them, right? So I think we need to provide a different paradigm in order to move people away from that narrative. Now, mm -hmm. you do that in your uh, argument for colorblindness, rightly understood, um, but you also offer, and you alluded to one of them, sort of uh, blind addition, a set of actual remedies. I mean, if we don't buy the neo-racist view of a world, but we don't just want to stand by and uh, see the amount of inequality we have today and the amount of, um, uh, you know, just 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 ill will between different ethnic groups. In fact, but as you point out in the book, uh, Americans think that we're doing less well in race relations today than ten or twenty or thirty years ago. Um, what are the steps we need to uh, embrace in order to? do better and provide people with this alternative paradigm for how to make progress. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, step one is embracing colorblind policies. I, I mentioned a few, I'll mention another traffic and red light cameras that, that take the police officer who can be biased out of the loop of many civilian police interactions, issue tickets using cameras and, and red lights, which can't be racially biased make sure they're placed equally in black, Hispanic, and white neighborhoods, and then let the machines do the work and just, uh, you know, enjoy this, the absence of those cop citizen interactions that can go left at any time. Uh, that's another example. So, so th those are examples of colorblind policies. I mentioned already the importance of 
of, of preserving the racial innocence of children. We had a, about, about a month ago, we had the, the story from the San Francisco Chronicle about woke kindergarten, where you have a, a school in San Francisco paying, um, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands or, or maybe more to, a uh, a consulting firm that is, you know, teaching kids about white supremacy, teaching kids to view themselves as racialized at a very young age. And most of these kids are English second language kids that, that, you know, they, they don't need to be told how to view them, how to be sensitized and paying attention to race. They need to be taught English and math. So what we have to do is preserve the period of racial innocence as long as possible. And that's, that's a cultural reboot that we need. Um, and then uh, finally, I, 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 I think we have to get rid of race in public policy. And I think there are executive orders around affirmative action that can be, you know, un, unordered around this. There are uh, many court interpretations of affirmative action notions that can be re reinterpreted in a colorblind way. And if we combine all of these steps, I think we make incremental progress towards a more colorblind society. And I view all of this in, against the backdrop of a wider enlightenment story about progress uh, towards the good life. Uh, and uh, a, a very, I'm very much in the school of Steven Pinker and in, in thinking that progress is important, progress is real, it's measurable to some degree, and that that gives you something to fight for. Um, uh, it gives get, it, it, one can get a story of of fighting for good in the world out of the values of the Enlightenment properly construed. I think this this question of progress is a really important one in this debate. Um, you know, Pinker talks about this. I talk about it in my book. You 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 allude to it in your book. You know, if the underlying assumption is that we haven't made any progress. If, like Derek Bell, one of the founders of critical race theory, you believe that America in the year 2000 is as racist as it was in 1950 or 1850, then I think the answers you just gave are going to appear radically unsatisfactory. Right? It's like, things are still as terrible as they ever were. There's all of these crying injustices. And you talk about, you know, a little change here and a little change there. That's going to trigger people, right? If you believe that we are making progress, that our society is imperfect, that there is discrimination, there is racism, but that actually there's less of it than there was 100 or 50 years ago, that we are doing better at including people and giving them opportunity, then to say, well, let's stay the course and course correct where we've gone right in the wrong direction and um, have some of these uh, you know, really incremental changes sounds like a much more convincing story. So what is the, the, the evidence for this? I mean, you, you, you talk about sort of one of the myths of um, neo-racism being, but we never make any progress um, on race, particularly, and on the on the uh, state of African Americans in the United States, particularly. Uh, what is the evidence that things are getting better, and that therefore perhaps we can trust uh, your remedies to keep pushing us towards a better world? Yeah, so I guess there's two broad lines of evidence that uh, racial progress has happened. One is the decrease of races, decrease in racism, and one is the increase in good outcomes for black Americans. Those are logically distinct sets. So racism has decreased precipitously over the past 100 years, over the past 50 years. You can see all the Gallup polls asking people, you know, would you, how would you feel if your child married a, a black person and vice versa? Those used to be terrible numbers in 1960, and they've come steadily down. And actual, at the behavioral level, intermarriage rates have gone up. If you look at, in a big picture sense, at at uh, uh, the phenomenon of passing, which is black people, if you're light skinned enough, pa trying to pass for black as as a result of the benefits that come with being seen as white as opposed to black. I trying to pass as white, not trying to pass as black. You mean? Thank you. Yes, but trying to pass as white so as to um, avoid the, the penalty of being considered black. Um, it used to be the case in the late 19th century, early 20th century, that something like 16 or 17 percent of black people passed as white at, at some point in their life, according to a study I, I cited in the book, which is a huge percentage, um, especially when you adjust it for how many black people could even get away with that, given 
the skin color spectrum. So it's like, you know, it, it used to be absolutely commonplace for almost any black person who could get away with it to, to switch over to white identity because it was just impossible. I mean, I mean, the, the, the color line was so, um, so, so, so sharp and, and so punishing. Nobody passes for white anymore. Nobody even tries. I haven't heard of a single person in my life, frankly. I haven't heard of someone who's heard of someone that, that passed for white. And in fact, the only famous case of passing in my lifetime has been Rachel Dolezal in the other direction. So uh, b broadly speaking, that's, that's a huge, uh, a huge, huge achievement and indicator of progress. Not to mention black president, black vice president, multiple black Supreme Court justices, and on and on and on. You go, you have mayors that are go, cities, major cities going on their sixth or seventh black mayor in a row. Um, there's no, no position of power, which black people haven't occupied black CEOs of for, f fortune 500 companies, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So that's all the evidence that racism has declined there. And then when you get on the actual outcomes, socioeconomic outcomes, I actually have a, a an essay on this from a few years ago called, um, the case for black optimism in, in Quillette, where I, I go through all of the data showing how outcomes have gotten better for, for black Americans over the past 50 years, over the past 30 years, even incarceration rates cut in half for black men in their twenties, uh, from 2001 to whenever I was writing, maybe 2019, more than cut in half actually for younger black men. Um, not a widely publicized fact, but a very important one. Um, you know, socioeconomic indicators up, uh, disease down, life expectancy up, and so, so on and so forth. All of these things have been going in the right direction, broadly speaking, since my father's generation. Uh, and uh, all of that is meaningful. Um, I broadly share that optimism, and I wrote about it in The Great Experiment, I think in particular that there's a kind of weird alliance between certain forms of uh, progressives, or if you want, certain forms of neo-racists on the one side, and uh, actually Donald Trump and some of his kind of rhetoric on the other side, right? I mean, Trump yeah. famously said in 2016, trying to win African-American voters. What do you have to lose? You know, what, yeah, what the heck <laughs> do you have to lose, right? Yeah. Sort of implying that the average African-American was leading uh, a terrible life and, and, and sort of woke progressives can sometimes talk about African-Americans in the same kind of way. And actually, when you look at the median African-American, um, you know, they have middle class jobs, they live in uh, uh, pretty nice suburbs, they now have, um, uh, you know, employer sponsored health insurance, which is a good uh, sort of metric for a relatively high quality job. Uh, and so on and so forth. I think the strongest argument against that position that I've had to grapple with in making that argument is to say, yes, but there is a significant percentage of the black population, however, where exactly, how, you know, how, however many percent exactly you're going to say it is, that do live in, uh, you know, very severe intergenerational poverty and very cut off from opportunity, right? When you are... Uh, on certain parts of the south side of Chicago, when you're in certain neighborhoods in Baltimore and certain neighborhoods in Philly, you just have these communities. But as a result of these historical injustices and their long-term impacts, uh, just face these very, very severe challenges. Um, and even as sort of obstacles to advancement into the highest level of society have clearly reduced, uh, been reduced or crumbled, um, even as the state of the average African American is pretty good, um, you know that kind of intergenerational underclass doesn't appear to be diminishing at a rapid pace. Um, what do you say, you know, to that part of the black experience, and what kind of response it calls for? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's definitely a problem. I would, I would say we should address it on a non-racial basis, given that there is equally uh, or not equally in, in, in the extent but there is a white underclass there's a hispanic intergenerational underclass you know there are i mean there are like mostly white counties in america whose life expectancy is at third world levels almost right there there are pockets of the country um 
that that are absolutely exhibiting all, all kinds of really deep problems from drug abuse to crime and more of those pockets are black than are white that's true but the problem is the pockets themselves we we need to direct resources the best research and the best public policy towards towards addressing these issues and race is not an inherent part of the issue the, if the issue is drugs in a community the issue is drugs if, if, if the issue is violence then the issue is violence and all of this ought to be addressed in non-racial terms it's not because people on the south side of chicago are black that we ought to that the that, that the state has an interest in ameliorating those problems it's because they're american it's it's not nor is it the problem in a, in a county in mississippi that's white that has a you know a life expectancy of 71 because of fentanyl and and all kinds of stuff doesn't matter that they're white. The, the the problem is if they're suffering, the state has an interest in in doing something to help. So that's how I think about it. And, and I don't think that that's a rejoinder. I don't think that that refutes the goal of colorblind public policy. I think it's perfectly compatible with it. Oh, no, sorry, no, no, nor, sorry, nor does it refute the overall trend in, in progress for black Americans as a group. Final question, Coleman. Um, how optimistic are you that we can make progress towards a more colorblind America? And uh, for those listeners who are persuaded by your case, um, what what can they do concretely to help bring it about? Well, uh, you, you can buy my book and give it to all your friends that disagree with you, um, available in fine bookstores everywhere, step one. But, you know, I, I don't know. Predictions, I try not to make predictions because they're always wrong. I'd rather, rather than predict whether we're going to, you know, whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic, I would just like to myself be an example and be part of the solution uh, and be, be part of the healthy path, path forward and hopefully inspire other people to uh, give people the inspiration and the arguments and so forth to also be part of the solution. Carmen Hughes, thank you for coming back on the podcast. Thank you, Yasha.